On tonight's Motor Week, Richard Hammond and Brendan Coogan check out three 4x4s, the Jeep Cherokee, the Toyota Colorado, and the very trendy Audi A6 All Road. Ian Royal looks at his used car bargain of the week, the Golf Cabriolet, and Ken Gibson attends the exciting unveiling of three all-new MG models at Longridge. This is the reality for most off-roaders. Sadly, the office car park is about as far off-road as their knobbly tyres ever get to venture. But there are those lucky 4x4s that get to play in the mud. All sorts of people regularly use their off-roader to off-road. And even to those whose piece of urban macho machinery is little more than an alternative to the tube or bus, they want to know that should things get sticky, their cars can hack it. Which means today's 4x4s have to be regular James Bonds if they're going to be tough enough to tackle the rough stuff and sophisticated enough not to drop a clanger in the city. Which is why we're sitting in a field... ..with a desk... ..and wellies... ..and a suit because today we're going to be looking at the twin personalities of these cars. First up, we've got the good old Jeep Cherokee, as much a piece of off-road designer-badged American heritage as it is a car. And the clever Toyota Colorado, big Japanese and... big and Japanese... Well, it's just big, really. And finally, the new pretender, the Audi Allroad. They reckon it redefines the class. A real James Bond. Well, we'll see. The Land Cruiser's been around in one form or another for nearly 50 years, and many people reckon it's still a proper off-roader. Should be all right out here, then. The Colorado fits in below its bigger, heavier and more expensive sibling, the Amazon, and competes with the likes of the Land Rover Discovery and Mitsubishi Shogun, the real heavyweights. This particular Colorado is powered by a 3-litre turbo diesel. Ooh, good and big engine. But it only puts out a measly 100 brake horsepower. But the good news is, there's loads and loads of torque, which is exactly what you need in an off-roader to give you that climb every mountain, chew through the mud kind of feel. And that is what you get in the Colorado. It does feel like a real big grown-up off-roader. There's no particularly good news when it comes to getting away quickly either. It takes 14 seconds to hit 60, and it's all over at 99 miles an hour. But of course, while the Toyota can claim to have been around for 50 years, the Cherokee is hardly lacking in pedigree. It is, after all, a descendant, albeit a distant one, of the original off-roader, the World War II Willis Jeep. Hammond, get in. Here, drive, eh? I'll just get in the back. Mind you, the Willis could be carried across a field by four men. Things have moved on a little since then, and the Jeep has put on quite a few pounds in every sense. Road, this Jeep is coping with everything I'm throwing at it so far, but because of the risk of getting stuck and the risk of Hammond taking the mickey big time, I'm being a bit gentle. Now, this course is very, very slippy, but provided you've got it in low ratio gearbox, this Jeep seems to be doing very well. I like it. The 4-litre petrol unit in this Cherokee puts the Toyota to shame with a whopping 176 brake horsepower, enough to get this big Jeep from 0 to 60 in under 10 seconds and carry on to a top speed of 112 miles per hour. Although you will pay the price for a heavy right foot, don't expect any more than 20 miles per gallon at the pump.
But of course there's also money to consider. The Jeep is the cheapest at just under £21,000. Then the Toyota at just less than £4,000 more. That comes in at just less than £25,000. And then there's the newcomer, the Audi. This petrol engine version costs around 12,000 more than the Colorado at over 36,000 pounds. So, lest we've been it before we've driven it, consider this. Yes, some interesting facts. The 16,000 pounds difference between the Cherokee and the Allroad would buy 5,000 gallons of unleaded at 80 pence a litre. Enough to keep you and your Cherokee in fuel for about 100,000 miles. Statistics aside, that's not what the Allroad is about. We're talking about its off-road ability without the compromises. Let's see if it lives up to it. Okay, now hold on tight in the back. Ready for the ride of your life. Uh, I'm gonna be rather careful. Of course, the first thing we've had to do in the Audi is adjust the suspension onto its highest setting. We don't want to go in our road mode, we want to go in our off-road mode. Setting number three, up at the top. And in fact, what this lacks in ground clearance and sheer grunt it hopefully is going to make up for in sophisticated gizmos to keep the wheels spinning under all circumstances. As they are now, before you say anything. So with a bit of luck, we won't get stuck. Thanks not to brute force or anything so macho as that, but to sophisticated technology and a lot of money. If you're interested in the engine, it's a 2.7 litre petrol and it's drinking fuel even as we speak faster than you can put stuff in. The result is, though, an awful lot of performance. And it is, I think, remarkably capable off-road. What do you reckon? Because of the more than adequate ground clearance of this Audi, the truth is it is very capable off-road. But let's face it, you've got £37,000 worth of leather and walnut. You are not going to be giving it the stick that Richard currently is. Let's face it, the closest this is going to get to off-road is probably the Silverstone car park. Ooh, well straight away, this is an entirely different ball game on the road. You can definitely feel the Audi A6's road-going heritage here. It's interesting to think that at 2.7 litres, it's the smallest engine of the three, but it feels by far and away the most powerful, just because of the way it puts that engine power down. Right, I'll be pros. And I'll be cons. OK, the Jeep. I think it's good value for money, it looks great, and it's reasonable off-road and not too bad on the road. But I think it's a very old design, it looks boxy and the engine is unrefined, it sounds like it needs oil. Then there's the Audi, when it comes to split personalities, you can't deny it's good on and off-road, and it does look great from every angle. But therein lies the problem, it's a master of none and a jack of all trades, and way overpriced. The Toyota Colorado, well it is a big chunky off-roader, although it's not done too well today, it is a proper old-fashioned 4 before. And it's got great cup holders and you can get a sheep in the back, but it's got all the sticking power of a Teflon pan. So, Richard, which one would you have? I'd go for the Jeep, it's cheap, I like the off-road performance and I like the style. You, what would you have? If money was no object, it'd be the Audi. Can I phone a friend? Uh, you got a friend? I haven't got any. Welcome to a rather rain-sodden Longbridge, home of MG Rover. Last time I was here, it was rather sadly for the death of the Mini. Today, much, much better news, I'm here for the birth of triplets. Three dazzling, all-new MG saloon cars. The press launch attracted the world's media back to Longbridge, for all the right reasons for a change. And the hundreds of journalists who attended underlined the attraction the MG name still has worldwide. Only time will tell if the public are as attracted by the MG name. The success of MG is crucial to MG Rover's long-term future and the 5,500 workers who operate from the Longbridge site. And in the long term it's equally important to the component industry in the West Midlands and the rest of Britain where another 20,000 workers' jobs depend on the success of MG Rover. Taking a look at the new range, it starts with the X30. Based on the stylish Rover 25, the car's been transformed into a pocket rocket hot hatch. Even the entry level model features front and large rear spoiler, an ice colour coded MG grille, 
sports exhaust tailpipes and 17-inch alloy wheels. The X20, Rover's last chance to sprinkle a little MG magic onto the worthy but uninspiring 45 model. And Stevens has done a great job in turning the 45 from family front to red hot racer with a sensational new styling kit and this massive rear spoiler. And finally the X10, the flagship of the entire range. They've now transformed the elegant Rover 75 saloon into a mean and menacing looking machine worthy of the MG badge. Main engine will be a 2.5 V6 litre but Rover are actually working on an MG Ultimate model of the X10 that will have a shattering 375 PS. This one will have speeds to top 150 miles an hour but it will also have a healthy little price tag of £30,000. Kevin Howe, Chief Executive of MG Rover Cars, this must be a very proud day for you. Well, it's a very proud day, I mean the cars are obviously spectacular but the other very positive thing is that we've developed the cars in such a short time period. The big question everyone is going to ask though is the cars look dramatically good but are they merely a cosmetic exercise geared to cash in on the famous MG badge? Absolutely not, I mean the, the, the uh, capabilities that Peter Stevens and Rob Oldacre have brought have turned these cars into real sort of race thoroughbred vehicles and they drive distinctly better than they actually look even. Peter Stevens, you are the gentleman that appears to have put the serious pizzazz back into MG. Explain what your main aims were when you set out to design these cars. Um, well, I'd say there's two aims, really. One aim is that we want to make a range of sporty cars that are accessible to everybody. You know, it's kind of become the fact that sports cars are something that you can no longer really aspire to. You just have a poster on your bedroom wall, but you never imagine you'll own one. We've got to make sports cars that people can imagine owning. You know, when they're older and they get a wee bit of money. It's important that, I think, to be much broader than sports car companies have been in the past. You know, from a personal point of view, it also gives me a chance to design cars that I can afford to buy. I've done stuff before that I could never afford, so there's a personal pleasure in that as well. Rob Oldacre is the product boss at MG Rover, the man with a crucial job of giving these cars the handling and the performance to match their devastatingly good looks. Rob, do you think you've succeeded? I have no doubt that we've succeeded. Uh, the, these cars have, uh, have really uh, begun to look better than we even expected them to ourselves, but of course it's the way that they behave dynamically that's uh, very important to us. And uh, what we've done under the skin is to uh, create almost uh, road racing cars for the road. And what we have here is um, a very much lowered suspension system, uh, complementing much wider wheels and tyres. Uh, much larger brakes, uh, improved damping to go with that stiffer springing, bigger roll bars, much tighter bushing, so we've got control over the wheels in a very tight fashion. Uh, steering is also attended to by making it a quicker ratio, which uh, gives a much faster turn in. So we've made the car less understeering than the equivalent Rover, which is fine for the Rover driver, but here we've got a, a car that handles uh, much more like a, a sports car should, and that's ideal for the, the sort of market that we're looking for, for, for MG owners. The good news from Nissan recently has confirmed that perhaps the British car industry is back on track. And after what we've seen today of the all-new MG saloons, I think we could be in for some more positive news. And who knows, if the British public respond as MG Rover hope they will, we could see a return of the great days of MG, when cars like this stunning 1939 WA dominated the roads. Let's hope so. Join us after the break, when Ian Royal checks out his used car bargain of the week. Oh, isn't it gorgeous? Just look at it. Brand new today. The way the, the circle is just, you know, well, round and the, the points, they, they meet the edges perfectly there. It's even got a little, a little stick here. It kind of wobbles on its little stick. It's just beautiful. Oh, and you get, um, you get one of these as well. Car. It is, in fact, the new Mercedes C-Class. And whereas its bigger brother, the S-Class, which this does look suspiciously like, is more likely to find itself living in a place with a drive, well, rather like this one, the C-Class is one strictly for suburbia.
Traditionally, Mercedes have not been aimed at the likes of me. I get bored of anything within six months, cars, three months. Mercedes are traditionally aimed at people who keep them for millennia. In fact, Mercedes are delighted to say that they've got about 3,000 orders already taken for this car before it goes on sale and before the people who are buying it have even seen it. That's because they've always bought Mercedes and they always will buy Mercedes, whatever they're like. You could put Mercedes on your old coat cap and sell it. It's actually longer than the previous C-Class, but because of its shape, it looks smaller, more compact, and that is translated in the drive. Whilst not exactly feeling tiny, it does feel a lot more nimble than the outgoing model. And it is a vaguely sporting experience. I say vaguely because, well, don't expect it to romp away madly. Easy choice of engines. This is the 200, which means it gets a two litre with a supercharger and about 163 brake horsepower. That translates, if you're interested in figures, to 0 to 60 in 9.3 seconds, which is quite respectable. The 180 has a two litre engine, and then it all gets a bit confusing, because there's a 2.6 in the 230, the 3.2 litre V6 in the 320. Who cares, you're not gonna remember them anyway. This is the kind of mid-range, probably one of the better sellers. And it does feel pretty strong, but it is still a Mercedes, so Sir and Modem are asked to restrain from anything that's too verging on the hooliganery. Another refreshing change comes in the fact that standard specification will be slightly higher than has been traditional with older Mercedes, where even wheel nuts would have cost you extra. You'll even find a six-speed manual gearbox as standard. Or you can opt for the five-speed automatic that we've got in our test car, which is, well, a little on the slushy side. Mercedes say, though, that they've answered critics of their previous manual gearboxes and their six-speeder is a lot sharper. That coupe-esque silhouette has another advantage apart from looking good. It does mean that it doesn't create as much drag, which of course in turn brings benefits in fuel consumption. Mercedes, in making their changes for the new C-Class, have dumped the old round dials, and we've got this kind of half-moon affair with a needle that cranks its way around the speedo set firmly in the middle. You wouldn't want to know about anything as vulgar as revs after all. And I'm not sure. I don't like it. I prefer round dials but that's just me. This is a crucial car for Mercedes. It's their big seller. They expect to sell thousands upon thousands of these. There's no word from Mercedes yet on prices, but expect it to be competitive. They're keeping quiet as of now, I suspect because they don't want BMW to turn around and knock a couple of hundred quid off every model and claim to be cheaper. It will sell. No doubt about it, just the three-pointed star on the front would see to that. But the difference is, this is a C-Class that you might just find desirable and not just the Tweedy set. Whereas the old one was very much a hyacinth bouquet to BMW's slinky Claudia Schiefer 3 Series, this new C-Class hits back with a naughty little Anna Corner Cover. It looks a lot better and is a lot faster too. Watch out, BMW. The VW Golf is one of the best-selling cars in history, loved across the world and driven by anyone from Vickers to fashion models and famous stars. And the Golf range is comprehensive, but for sheer style, you can't beat the Golf convertible. It looks the part parked up outside your favourite wine bar and top down in summer, cruising the country lanes or even better, the Santa Monica Coastal Highway in your dreams. There's a reassuring feel to a Golf as well. It's chunky, well-built, reliable and solid. It's always been a bit weird the way that VW have launched their Golf convertibles because they've either come along late in the current model's production life or even after that model has finished production. And this car is a case in point. Now this is a Mark III Golf. The latest Golf that you can buy is what they call the Mark IV. However, this has been tarted up a bit to look like the current model, if you see what I mean. It's just the way VW do things. So what to look out for? Well, check the hood thoroughly for any signs of wear or tears, rips or cuts in it. You don't want to have to pay for a new top because they're expensive. OK, I know it looks good with the roof down, but I'm afraid it's the middle of winter. The sun may be shining, the sky may be blue, but I'm a wimp and the roof's going back up again.
Now this car is a 99 T-Reg, it's done about 15,000 miles. When it was new, it cost over 18,000 pounds. It's now probably worth somewhere about 12,000 pounds, but you don't have to pay as much as that. The great thing about the Golf Cabriolet range is that they hold their value very well. They are hard to find, they're desirable, and that's why they can look expensive. An early Golf Clipper Cabrio on a G-plate expect to pay around £3,000. A 95 N-Reg 1.8 Cabrio with 39,000 miles should cost you about £8,000. And an R-Reg Avant-Garde comes in at 10,500. I think the biggest letdown on this car is the way that it drives. Don't get me wrong, it's not bad, but it's just OK. Remember that it's based on an early 90s car and there have been tremendous improvements to the handling, the suspension and the general drivability of Golfs. The ride is not as smooth as you would expect, but there's no scuttle shake from what is an ugly looking roll bar behind me. Now winter in Britain is not really the best time to be looking at soft tops. However, the prices do tend to be cheaper at this time of the year. So if you've got your heart set on a cool cabrio, buy a Golf before spring. That's this week's used car tip, the Golf Convertible. On the next edition of Motor Week, we check out the winners of the prestigious What Car Car of the Year ceremony.